thank you all for coming. I'm really glad to see such a good turnout for an event on a discussion of poverty and social policy. Usually we only get this kind of turnout if the, you know, if the headline is, you know, somebody's going to tell all about what really happened in the in the Colin Powell State Department or something like that. So, so this is inspiring, actually. I'm Mark Schmidt. I'm a senior fellow here at the New America Foundation. Um, one of the people, along with Reed Kramer, Michael Calabrese, and others here, who are involved in our in our new initiative on the next social contract to really begin to to rethink all the pieces of how we manage the relationships uh, between individuals, whether they're workers or or, or, or or not in the workforce, employers and government, so that so that uh, so that the benefits of, of prosperity are, are widely shared and people have the security they need to to, to take advantage of opportunity in the uh, in this economy. This is, I think, the third event we've had uh, under the uh, loose rubric of the uh, of the next social contract, and I think the, kind of the as as we've as we've gone through this process of thinking about the next uh, social contract, I think the the cornerstone of our analysis has begin to, has has been to say that what we want to really understand is is kind of what we can change about how the economy works for people and and how we and 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 what we can't change and want to kind of uh, use social insurance to protect people against uh, and and how we want to how we want to think about basic concepts like poverty in the middle class and uh, and 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 how we sort of organize our thinking about those um, about those topics and I think we uh, share a view that in the uh, last few year, last few decades, um, our thinking about the social contract or the welfare state has been has been constrained by a kind of cautiousness, both about the economy and about politics. There's a general sense that you know. You, you, there, there are things that you can't touch. They kind of move of their own. We say we can't, you know, we can't do anything about about the way uh, the way globalization. These things distribute benefits. The best we can do is maybe use the earned income tax credit or things like that to kind of to kind of shore people up at the uh, at the at the very end. And both assumptions about the economy and assumptions about the limits of politics have. Uh, have limited us to what are essentially very timid interventions in the uh, in the uh, in the in the way the the economy works for people, such as tax credits. Um, and what we want to do here is start to is start to at least challenge some of those assumptions. We may come back to saying, well, you know, that actually was a right assumption. The the cost of challenging it may be greater than than uh, than the other uh, than the than than the benefit. But at least at least open our minds a little bit uh, to what might be possible if you if you think about these questions a little more deeply. Um, and earlier this year. Uh, I, I'd, I'd come across Chris Howard's name, and, and he'd written a very good uh, he's written a very good book on tax credits. But earlier this year, I, there was sort of one-two punch uh, where I realized that uh, that Chris, who's a professor of government at William and Mary College of William and Mary, is really a fellow traveler in thinking about uh, about these things. The first was was a, was a long article about the overuse of uh, of tax credits, uh, which which coincided with a very short and not so well informed article of my own. Uh, uh, at, you know, so that so we got an email touch because of that. Uh, his article was in the is in the journal Democracy. We have a few uh, copies of the full magazine uh, as well as uh, as well as just copies of his of his article. If you just if you want to you know narrow cast to just that uh, to just that topic. Uh, and about the same time, probably in exactly the same in exactly the same month, his book uh, The Welfare State Nobody Knows uh, came out, which is. Which is uh, really looks at a lot of the myths of the welfare state, a lot of the a lot of the assumptions about how, about you know how the world works uh, that kind of that that often constrain our uh, our thinking about social policy. The, the you know the assumption that if a program is for poor people, it's always going to be a poor program. The assumption that 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 tax credits are always better a better way to do things than 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 more aggressive interventions and so forth. Um, uh, I think Chris Chris shares with with Jacob Hacker, who's been a New America Foundation uh, 
fellow and, and presented here a number of times. I, they share a kind of a recognition that when you see a certain pattern in American uh, social policy, that's not necessarily proof that that's the way it's always going to be and that it reflects something deep in the, in the American character uh, that, 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 that you challenge at your own risk, that often it just, it's the way it is because a certain configuration of politics and economics and opportunity and, 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 and crisis and, 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 and who is in power happened to be in place at a, cer at a certain moment. Um, and, and that there were false starts and half steps and, and we, can, uh, uh, we, can, we can sort of look at alternate histories in which, things w uh, in which other things worked out in very different ways. Um, and uh, a number of chapters of this book look at, look at, 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 uh, at some of those issues, uh, the role of states and the development of, of, of workers' compensation policies and so forth in, in just that way. Um, so I I'm, I'm, was eager to, to bring some of these ideas uh, to, to New America. And uh, an, another uh, another person, a friend of mine, who's who's really been thinking in a in a not quite the uh, along not quite the same lines, but very important and innovative lines, is Margie Waller, who is um, uh, was worked on on poverty policy issues in the uh, in the Clinton White House, and uh, and and runs uh, the Mobility Agenda, which has always been one of my favorite. Uh, Interventions of really helping people uh, fi find you know physical access to where to where jobs are, and is uh, is one of the founders of a new of a new organization called Inclusion, uh, which which was sort of which was originally a set of people doing a blog called Inclusionist.org, and then turned into a has turned into a real uh, organization, and and they've really raised some very important challenges to the basic assumptions about how we think and talk about and, and talk about poverty. I think some of her arguments in some ways challenge some of the some of the points that Chris is making um, but 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 also share a, a kind of a kind of fresh perspective and a, and a new way of thinking about about these issues so this is not a this is not a debate but a but a, a, a sense that that uh, Margie's work from you know w which begi begins in the trenches of policy making in Washington uh, is in, will be a, a useful commentary on Chris's work, which 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 begins in uh, in deep historical uh, and and political science research about these issues. So Chris will speak for for some time. Margie will comment, and uh, and then we'll open it up to uh, to questions and answers. If you've been here before, you you know that drill. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for inviting me, and thank you all for coming. Because today officially marks the beginning of summer, I'd like you to think about ice cream. Imagine living in a town with only one ice cream shop. This particular shop is unusual because it serves just two flavors of ice cream, bacon for $1 a scoop and Belgian chocolate for $8 a scoop. When customers ask, is that it? They are told that a special team from headquarters is in charge of new flavors. Unfortunately, no one at the shop knows when that team will produce anything. In fact, it's been years since their last innovation. Periodically, an old-timer behind the counter reminisces fondly about a couple of times when the team developed some wonderful flavors. Now, if you live in this town, you don't have many good choices. You can try to persuade yourself that bacon isn't really a nasty flavor of ice cream. You can start saving your money to buy the Belgian chocolate. Or you can hope that the creative geniuses at headquarters get their act together sometime soon. In frustration, some of you might drive around to nearby towns and try to figure out why their ice cream shops offer more flavors and at reasonable prices. Eventually, most people in this town will get discouraged any time they talk about ice cream. Now, with a few adjustments, we can substitute U.S. social policy for ice cream in this story and have a pretty accurate picture of the conventional wisdom. For a long time, we've been told that U.S. social programs come essentially in two flavors. One kind of program is the policy equivalent of bacon ice cream, relatively inexpensive but highly unpopular. Even people who get to taste this ice cream for free don't like it. These programs are targeted at the poor, and the classic example is welfare, now known as Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, TANF. The other kind of social program may be expensive, but it's much more popular. Social Security and Medicare are the policy equivalents of Belgian chocolate ice cream. Now, most political scientists with an ounce of dignity would never compare social programs to ice cream. The prevailing image in the literature is a two-tiered American welfare state, 
featuring an upper tier of social insurance programs anchored by Social Security and a lower tier of public assistance built around welfare. I'm not long on dignity, certainly not since I've started having kids, and the mental image of eating bacon ice cream captures the distaste of means-tested programs just as well than the image of standing on some lower tier and looking up. The creative geniuses at headquarters in the world of social policy, those would be Democrats. When you have huge numbers of them in national office, including many liberal Democrats, you see remarkable bursts of innovation. Case in point is the New Deal of the mid-1930s, which gave rise to Social Security, welfare, unemployment insurance, public housing, and national minimum wage laws. Likewise, the Great Society of the mid-1960s gave us Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, and Head Start. Without supermajorities in Congress, however, Democratic presidents are supposed to fail. Witness the demise of national health insurance under Truman and Clinton. A number of analysts who recognize this pattern argue that the key to progress is revitalizing the Democratic Party and ultimately electing so many Democrats that another great society is possible. And they've tried to convince policymakers that the country really can afford national health insurance, paid parental leave for all, and other broadly inclusive social programs, the Belgian chocolate option. Some analysts spend time examining the social policies of other nations, especially Canada and Europe, trying to figure out how their welfare states turned out so much better than ours. In other words, they're driving around in search of better ice cream. And many observers are discouraged by the current state of social policy. After decades of divided government and Republican rule, the chances of a democratic landslide seem pretty remote. Spending on Social Security and Medicare will continue to grow as the baby boom generation retires, making it difficult to see how any new social programs will be financed. In the meantime, poverty remains stubbornly high, more and more people are living without health insurance, and inequality is growing. One problem with this conventional wisdom is that, figuratively speaking, we do not live in a town with only two flavors of ice cream. Although welfare has been unpopular for years and has suffered cutbacks, other programs for the poor have grown. In the 1980s and 1990s, policymakers deliberately expanded Medicaid and the Earned Income Tax Credit to benefit more people with limited incomes. And they did so multiple times. Medicaid used to serve families with children below the poverty line. Now it serves families up to and somewhat above the poverty line. In 1985, Medicaid paid for one birth out of every six in this country. It currently pays for more than one out of every three births. In 1985, the EITC was a $2 billion program, hardly worth mentioning. By 2005, it had grown to $40 billion, surpassing welfare, food stamps, and public housing in size. Largely because of Medicaid and the EITC, spending on anti-poverty programs actually grew faster than spending on social insurance programs between 1980 and 2000. This year marks the 10th anniversary of the state children's health insurance program, SCHIP. Thanks to it and Medicaid, health insurance coverage among children has been increasing, while coverage among non-elderly adults has been decreasing. In short, we cannot generalize about means-tested programs based on welfare. There's an old saying that programs for the poor are poor programs, meaning they are politically vulnerable. That's just not true across the board. Another problem with the conventional wisdom is that some shops sell more than ice cream. They may offer frozen custard or snow cones, but if all you're looking for is ice cream, you'll miss these other choices. In the United States, we become so fixated on social insurance and public assistance that we seem to forget all the other ways to make social policy. More than any nation in the world, the United States uses the tax code to promote social welfare objectives. Known as tax loopholes, tax breaks, or tax subsidies, the formal name for this practice is tax expenditure. The United States spends hundreds of billions of dollars each year on various tax expenditures for health insurance, retirement pensions, housing, and income support. Some of these tax expenditures are relatively new, such as the child tax credit. Many of them, such as the home mortgage interest deduction, have been around for decades. Whether new or old, tax expenditures for social welfare purposes are growing. Taking account of inflation, the cost of tax breaks for homeowners has doubled since 1980. The cost to subsidize health and pension benefits has grown even faster. 
In less than 10 years, the child tax credit went from nothing to $45 billion. In addition, social regulations are an important but overlooked part of the American welfare state. Minimum wage laws are probably the best known example, but we should also include the Family and Medical Leave Act, which requires many employers to offer parental leave. The Americans with Disabilities Act, which requires employers to make special accommodations for handicapped workers. And a variety of regulations governing private health insurance, known by such acronyms as COBRA and HIPAA. By the same token, the U.S. government issues loan guarantees for housing and operates the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation to ensure thousands of company pension plans against bankruptcy. While all of this may not amount to a European-style welfare state, it does reflect a sizable commitment of fiscal resources and legal authority. The American welfare state is built differently than its European counterparts, but that doesn't mean the American welfare state is small. Once you recognize these different tools of social policy, you soon realize that innovation hasn't been limited to the New Deal and the Great Society. The 1940s gave us the GI Bill, providing loan guarantees for housing. The 1950s gave us a new tax expenditure for job-based health insurance. That tax break now benefits more people than Medicare and Medicaid combined. The most sweeping revision of pension regulations occurred in 1974, accompanied by a new tax break for individual retirement accounts and the aforementioned Pension Benefit <coughs> Guarantee Corporation. The Earned Income Tax Credit became law in 1975. More recently, we've seen the passage of the Americans with Disability Act in 1990, the Family and Medical Leave Act, 93, and the Child Tax Credit in 97. In terms of family policy, the decades since the Great Society have been the most productive in U.S. history. The EITC and the Child Tax Credit are comparable to European-style family allowances, and the U.S. finally enacted parental leave legislation. New social programs appear regularly, certainly more often than twice a century. If you're the kind of person who worries about impediments to social policymaking, these developments might expand your sense of possibilities. Given that the United States has created and expanded social programs with and without huge democratic majorities, perhaps we don't need to recreate the political landscape of 1964. Maybe we can work with what we have. The forecast looks even better after you study recent innovations. In many cases, Republicans have been just as involved as Democrats. Republican Senator Jacob Javits was the main architect of pension reform in the 1970s. The first President George Bush was instrumental to passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Congressional Republicans, many of them quite conservative, pushed hard for the child tax credit. A new prescription drug benefit for Medicare recipients was one of the top priorities of the current Bush administration. Republican officials, often with the support of business interests, have called for expanding the EITC and have tried to protect a variety of tax expenditures against cutbacks. In each and every case, Republicans and Democrats have worked together to expand the size and scope of the American welfare state. At a time when the two parties are evenly matched, this record of bipartisanship sounds very promising. Is it possible to enact and expand social programs in the contemporary United States? That's the question underlying a lot of writing and arguing about U.S. social policy. My answer is, sure, we do it all the time. In periods of war or peace, when the economy is strong or weak, whether the country is run by Democrats, Republicans, or Democrats and Republicans. Acts of creation and expansion are so common that it's not terribly useful to wonder if such moments will ever happen again. Instead, we need to talk more about the kind of welfare state we want to build. Which social programs are most important to attack? Who should be helped and how much? Now, the usual way to have this debate is for one side to argue in favor of targeting aid to the poor and the other side to argue in favor of universal programs. We can and have had these debates over health insurance, child care, higher education, and other policies. There is, however, a third option, not one that I endorse, but one that has steadily become more prevalent in recent years. It is possible to design social programs that appear broadly inclusive on paper yet in practice direct aid to the middle and upper middle classes. You might think of this practice as phony universalism. 
Although the political appeal of this option is strong, I'm not quite sure how we justify the programs that help the haves and not the have-nots. The lack of public justification for this practice suggests that other people are having the same trouble. Now, several examples of phony universalism can be found among the largest tax expenditures. The home mortgage interest deduction, for instance, will cost the government an estimated $75 billion in lost income tax revenue this year. Over two-thirds of this money will go to taxpayers earning over $100,000. Maybe 3% will go to people earning less than $40,000. Tax expenditures for employer pension and health benefits cost over $200 billion combined. Roughly half of all employees receive these benefits. These individuals are usually well-paid professionals or skilled workers in unionized industries. The latest figures from the Congressional Budget Office show that workers earning over $120,000 are four times more likely to participate in a tax-favored retirement plan compared to workers earning under $20,000. The child tax credit is one of the success stories of the last 10 years. It took the EITC three decades to grow as large as the child tax credit did in less than one decade. The advocates of the child tax credit said it would help all families with children. Nevertheless, if you look at who actually benefits, you'll discover that taxpayers earning over $75,000 receive about twice as much of the total benefit as taxpayers earning less than $30,000. Some of our social regulations work the same way. The Family and Medical Leave Act is clearly not a universal program. Employees of small companies are excluded, and these workers tend to be less educated and lower paid. The fact that parental leave is unpaid means that more affluent workers can afford to take the full 12 weeks. Workers living paycheck to paycheck, in contrast, need to get back to work as fast as possible. Similarly, when we regulate private health insurance, we help those with private health insurance. Again, mostly the middle and upper middle classes. When we insure company pensions through the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, we follow the same pattern. And you don't need a PhD in political science to figure out what's going on. With Democrats and Republicans so closely balanced for so many years, it makes sense for elected officials to pay particular attention to the needs of likely voters and prospective donors. Given that political participation varies directly with income and education, politicians will be looking for ways to help the haves and the have lots. Many of our current tax expenditures and social regulations perform that function very nicely. Of course, it is a rare official who says publicly that government ought to subsidize $500,000 homes more than $100,000 homes. We seldom hear that uh, politicians argue that governments ought to help the poor, the elderly, the well-educated, and the well-paid to get health insurance, but not the child care worker or the store clerk. We do hear some politicians scold the public for failing to save enough for retirement without mentioning that government spends tens of billions of dollars to help some workers, generally affluent workers, build sizable pensions. I've tried hard to imagine a principled defense of this practice, and here's my best shot. Everyone knows that economic inequality is getting worse in the United States. What many don't know, however, is that almost all of the growth in inequality has happened in the top half of the income distribution. The gap between the rich and poor in this country has grown because the gap between the rich and the middle class has grown. The income gap between the poor and the middle class is virtually identical today to what it was 30 years ago. Therefore, we may want to emphasize social policies that close the gap between the middle class and the rich. Tax expenditures are probably the best way to accomplish this goal. Tax expenditures are financed out of income taxes, which are still one of the most progressive sources of revenue in this country, definitely more progressive than payroll taxes. In 2005, individuals earning over $100,000 paid four-fifths of all income taxes. Individuals earning over $200,000 paid over half. The major tax expenditures for housing, health, and pensions effectively redistribute income from the rich and the upper middle class to the middle and the upper middle class. In their own way, these programs do address inequality. If we keep going down this path, then we will continue to sever the historic connections between poverty and inequality. Traditionally, social programs have attacked these two programs simultaneously. Means-tested programs like welfare and Medicaid target benefits at the poor and are largely financed by the affluent. 
Social Security lifts millions of senior citizens out of poverty and, through its benefit formula, reduces income inequality among retirees. But we can choose to fight inequality without doing much at all about poverty. Actually, we have been making this choice for quite some time, implicitly and without much debate. Personally, I don't find this a path very attractive. I worry that public officials will make a lot of noise about reducing inequality, allow the public to think that something meaningful will also be done about poverty, and create policies that serve the more affluent half of the nation. I worry that it will become even harder to make poverty a national priority because so many people will assume that all of this social spending must be helping the poor. Some of it is, but a lot of it is not. When we discuss the future of the American welfare state, I hope we can spend a little less time wondering if change is possible and more time talking expli explicitly about whose welfare we want to promote. Please do not infer from my comments about poverty that I feel the poor should be the only beneficiaries of social programs. Many middle class people are also having trouble paying for medical care, affording a home, and saving for retirement. Social programs that cut across class lines may well be justified or we may want to devote some additional resources to programs for the middle class and some for the poor and create separate programs for each group. But as long as 37 million Americans live below the poverty line, I'll be skeptical of any policy initiatives that leave them out. So Chris and I uh, met for the first time today, uh, other than by email and so forth. Um, so he doesn't know that um, ice cream is my particular um, vice. Uh, I, I have a real love for ice cream. I grew up in Cincinnati, which if you've never been there, has honestly, truly the best ice cream in the world. Somebody knows. <laughs> Grater's ice cream. It is so good that... Um, my father, when he's feeling really, really generous to me, will actually send some to me. <laughs> um, so I'm, that's all I'm thinking about now after that talk. Um, but I am, I'm going to take my uh, lead, I think in a way from Mark's introduction, uh, my uh, thinking on these, this general topic area uh, starts with you know, the fact that I, d I do work on policy and I have spent most of my career trying to <laughs> think about system change and how we go about uh, accomplishing system change. And recently, uh, I would say, m thinking about how we move this agenda um, really came into focus for me after Hurricane Katrina. As um, Chris says in his article in Democracy, Dem designing remedies is not terribly difficult. The hard part is generating support for reform. I thought it was a you know, great caps capsulization of what happened after Hurricane Katrina. So we, you know, many of us in this room have spent years coming up with laundry lists of policy proposals that we have ready to you know, pop out the, the minute there's an opportunity to talk about it. And people will tell you there, when there's a crisis, that's oftentimes when policy change happens. And so after watching you know, weeks of coverage of concentrated poverty and the impact of concentrated poverty in Katrina, one would have thought, um, I certainly did, that we might have seen more focused policy change at the federal level as a result. But we didn't. Um, the best uh, sort of <laughs> the best argument we were having uh, several weeks after was whether it would be all right or not to give four months of extended Medicaid to the victims of Katrina. And we were talking about taking dollars away from other programs that serve needy populations in order to pay for the rebuilding and some of the services to victims of Katrina. So for me, that I mean, it really focused my thinking on how should we be approaching these issues and talking about these issues and trying to build support for these, these policy changes that we're looking for. One of the things that uh, Chris's book covers is the uh, differences in the way in this country we talk about and in fact define poverty as compared to other countries. And here we have, as everybody in this room knows, a very inadequate definition of poverty, one that was created uh, based on family budgets in the 1950s and assumed uh, a certain amount being spent on food and that's how we determine whether or not people are poor, whether in fact whether or not they would starve if they didn't have enough money. That's, that's our formula. And of course, 
the world has changed since the 1950s and family budgets have changed too and we now spend a lot more on housing and transportation than we did then but our formula hasn't changed at all. But our measure is really one that is intended to determine whether or not people are so materially deprived that they might starve if they didn't have more income. In other countries, poverty means something and is measured very differently. In other countries, it's really a measure of social inclusion. Is everyone doing as well as uh, sort of relative, how well are people doing relative to everyone else? So it's a measure of relative income and 50 or 60 percent, if you fall below 50 or 60 percent of median income, then you are poor in those countries. And if you think about it, when you decide what your goal is, that helps you think about what your policies should be to meet your goal, right? So if your goal is simply to make sure that if you're a household of four, your income is slightly above $20,000, you know, that's one goal. You can do that. That's how you get people above the poverty line. In other countries, if they're thinking about making sure that no one falls too far behind the rest, because that would be bad for everyone. That's how they're thinking about poverty. And, and I'm not sure how we change the way we think about poverty in this country and whether we have to come up with new language or new concept or exactly how it works. But the idea of our goal really being making sure that as people progress, everyone progresses at about the same rate and, and not exactly the same level, but that if people at the top are doing really, really well, then people at the bottom should be doing relatively better at the same time. So, you know, what I want to do, I guess I'd say, I want to, I want to change the world and I want to think about our world and how, I want to think about how we do that within a framework that's consistent with our, our values. And the concern I have about um, starting with poverty as a way to design the remedies is that it's really about us and them, right? It's those people, we're going to target a program to them. Um, so. You know, one of the solutions that Chris mentioned was thinking about designing some programs that target certain kinds of benefits to, to address poverty and others to address this inequality that might exist between high income and middle income people. I guess I, you know, I, I'm not going to say that I have the answer today, but I really do think that we've, we get into trouble when we start dividing the world into us and them, and we do better both in terms of, you know, just our our, Nash, our values and where we're headed, and having people listen to us and be with us when we're thinking about things that benefit all of us. That might be universal programs, it might not, um, uh, but it, it really is a different way of thinking about it than we have. Um, another nice thing about a social inclusion approach as, as opposed to a poverty approach, whatever language you choose to use, the poverty language is really, in this country, it really is about income, and yet, I, I know that I and, and my, my colleagues, my peers in this city, when we talk about our <coughs> proposals to address poverty, as, as some of us did say after Katrina, when we tried to develop a list of things that we might want to put together in, in a package of policies, it always goes way beyond income and it, it, poverty, right? It goes, we, we start talking about things like housing and education, uh, you know, paid sick days and health care and unions and child care and pre-kindergarten and all of those things that, you know, would be easy for, I think, for our opponents to say, that's, that's all fine and good, but that's a different thing from income poverty, which is what we measure in this country. And so I don't know if you all picked up on your way in my, um, my Washington Post, or Washington, not the Post, it's a Washington News article. Um, and this is really my attempt at thinking about, well, suppose, for example, there are, there are a number of proposals now, and there's one presidential candidate talking about, actually, I think more than one, talking about establishing a goal to reduce or end poverty. My concern is if, that's, if that is the goal that we adopt, it will end up with two competing proposals to uh, accomplish that goal in Congress. And of course, the media always covers this as, well, you have this proposal and this proposal. They can only cover two at a time. So one's going to be, uh, you know, a comprehensive list of proposals that we, we have all seen. We all have, you know, Senator Kennedy's staff, I'm sure, all carries in a laminated card in their back pocket. You know, we know what that list looks like. It's very comprehensive. It's long. The other side will say, oh, poverty, income poverty. We know there are two things you need to do to address that. It's marriage and it's work, and we're going to have a bill that's the bill to end poverty with marriage and work, and then the progressives will have a bill that's very comprehensive and it's laundry list. And I guess my question is, so, you know, if you had to predict, how do you think that would come out, 
right? I won't try to answer it. You can think about it. Um, but that's what worries me and why I really do think that we have to come up with a new way of talking about our goals, even if our personal goals and values are, mu are much more targeted to those most in need and, and addressing issues of inequality and making sure that nobody falls too far behind. Thinking about it in, in a way that is about all of us and not about us and them strikes me as, as a better way to go. One last thing I'll just point you to. Uh, apparently, we didn't bring enough copies for everyone here, but this article, um, which I and uh, four colleagues wrote about a month ago, which puts out, puts forward this concept of social inclusion and reviews some of the, the history and, and the concerns that we have about a poverty approach to really some of the same policy. Um, is something you might want to download. And Mark mentioned our website. It's www.inclusionist.org. And there's actually a whole section in Clearinghouse of information on how to think about these issues, what some of the research, political science and communications research tells us, and then a copy of this paper that you can, can download there as well. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you both very much. Um, this is exactly the the kind of uh, of interchange I had in mind, and the inclusionist.org is is very interesting. The, there was a particular exchange uh, of discussion about after the release of the poverty plan uh, from the Center for American Progress, uh, which brought out a lot of interesting issues and was one of those discussions that actually converged more on agreement than widening disagreement. So I, I found that really uh, really interesting to read. I guess I want to start off with one question. Uh, here, which you know, I'm a I'm a veteran of the welfare reform battles of uh, of the mid '90s, and one thing that struck me as uh, going through that period, was sort of that all the focus was on was on work, requ you know, requiring people to work, and that was the story. Exactly what Margie Margie said before, you know, work and marriage versus uh, versus programs, but underneath all that, beginning well, be beginning in the '80s. Chris alluded to some of this. What we essentially had, what essentially happened there, was an enormous transformation in the way we deal with poverty and near poverty from programs that essentially support are, are about people who are destitute to shifting everything to a, essentially a safety net for people who are working. So that you know, in the in the early 80s, to be on Medicaid was by definition to be on welfare. There was no income. It wasn't any. It wasn't about income. It was about where you on. It was. It was. It was automatically connected. You begin to. You begin to create categories. If you can be on Medicaid, if you're working and and lower income, you build out the EITC. And then you have the work requirements. You put this package together, and all of a sudden, you've gone from a destitution-based safety net to a work-based safety net. And I guess that then the question becomes: If you talk, having done that, even though it's sort of a silent transformation compared to all the. Sturm und Drang about about work requirements, um, and and you know the the conservative scholar Doug Besharov wrote a paper a couple of years ago that said, hey, you know what, folks, actually it was all these supports did a lot more to to, to lead to any of the successes of welfare reform than did the the work requirements, um, and we're and we're building a we're building something out there. Does that transformation change the way in which you're able to talk about poverty? Because we are, by its very nature, talk. You know, does it change the sort of deserving versus undeserving poor equation? Does it does it change what what is possible to talk about if people do understand that 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 you know what we what we spend money on in the in the realm of poverty and near poverty is about people who are working, uh, and not people who are not working, or is the cost of that too high? I mean, are, are we in fact leaving people too far behind who are indeed destitute? Uh, and and left out of the welfare, uh, left out of, of of what remains of welfare, which is always which is the more traditional liberal concern. Okay, that's a question for both of you. Okay, um, I definitely agree with your description of events in the 80s and 90s. I think there is a broader change going on in welfare well before 96, and I think that some of the programs that I talked about growing, like the EITC and Medicaid grow in part because advocates find ways of trying to portray recipients as deserving, of trying to sort of talk more about, well, it's not just the poor, but it's the people who are actually working for a paycheck. Surely we'd all agree they deserve more help. Or it's, it's infants, 
right? How can you blame an infant for being poor? Let's get them some health care. Um, there was also expansions of, of uh, support for disabled children, uh, roughly the same time. Um, so th there have been ways in which certain kinds of poor Americans have found more support. Um, at the same time, to be a non-working poor adult in this country uh, is a really bad situation. Um, and I, I think there has been a, a strategy of trying to uh, help those who seem uh, easiest politically to help, uh, but there's a, a group out there who uh, is either off welfare or has been kicked off um, who's, who's really struggling and there's just not going to be much of a constituency uh, for them. Um, I have so many things I want to say and answer that question. So, um, so first thing I would say is uh, there's a recent uh, article reviewing public opinion surveys from... Could you use the mic, please? I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a recent rev uh, review of public opinion surveys from before welfare reform and after. And it <coughs> finds no change. Okay. So uh, I think contrary to, you know, the general wisdom of what we all think is that actually welfare reform changed the way we think about the, the poor and, and the deserving poor, that you know, these are people who are working and therefore we can help them. There's actually no change in public opinion. Same, same question. Um, in fact, if anything, it looks like, almost like, uh, the public is, le is less inclined to um, be willing to support people who are, are working and poor because it, 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 the... <coughs> Some of the communications researchers will tell you it's because people who people view people who are poor as being there through some fault of their own, right? It's not it's not systemic. It's some bad decision they made. And I will say that I recently kind of walked into this firestorm. There was a an AP article about the Bloomberg's poverty proposal, which he every couple of weeks he announces some new aspect of it and they all write about it. Um, it's this conditional cash transfer. Have you all heard about this? It's something that he, his economic commission addressing poverty issues in New York did not come up with this proposal. He came up with it on his, on his own, which is to pay people for, as the press keeps calling it, doing the right thing. So paying parents for getting their kids to the doctors, for kids for getting to, going to school and for doing well in school, uh, for getting a job, for staying in a job, giving people extra cash payments for doing all of these things. They're going to test this idea to see if it, it ends intergenerational poverty. By the way, they're, they're going to do it for two years to test this idea. Um, anyway, I've, I've been critical of this. Um, and, and not so much really because I think it's bad to experiment and figure out whether something like this might work. I'd be kind of interested to know and they've got MDRC, the best in the business, actually doing the evaluation and the design and that's all good. My concern is he keeps shining a, Bloomberg keeps shining a spotlight on this as though this would solve poverty. And so I was critical of this making the point that it wouldn't solve poverty and the conservative blogs are like all over me because it's all, for them, poverty is all about personal responsibility. and you know, although they're not entirely comfortable with the idea of government paying, you know, a select population for doing the right thing, that seems a little crazy to them. People should either do the right thing or not do the right thing. They do think that people are poor because they're either doing the right thing or not doing the right thing. And that seems to be something that actually hasn't changed much pre and post welfare reform. So I don't know if it changes the way we talk about it. Um, I, I too am concerned about those people who are, who are being left behind by our focus on those who work. Uh, however, I don't think we win by leading with them. Um, and it's again, it's that sort of us versus them. Uh, and in fact, most people do work, most people go in and out of work, um, and figuring out how we can make those jobs into better jobs and jobs that people can stay in and can do well in while they're in them and can move up and out of seems to me the better place to focus our, our energy. Um, but I'd like to know better how to answer that question, really. I'm actually, I'm gonna stand up here and take just so I can see everybody's hands and uh, and and open it up to Q and A, Margie. I'm glad you said most of the things that at least that you, you were, that that question prompted uh, in you. So we'll just open it up to the uh, to the audience. Please state your name and your most relevant affiliation, and please uh, say something that could reasonably have a question mark at the end of it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sonia Michelle, and I teach history and particularly history of social welfare policy at the University of Maryland College Park. Um, and I know Chris's work very well, and I see Margie's name around a lot. Um, my question is a comment, <laughs> with, with a question at the end. Um, 
the, the word gender or the or the word women has not come up. I mean, you sort of referred to it obliquely um, in in some of the comments that both of you made. But it seems to me that one of the big snags in trying to really develop programs that will help people stay in work is to get over it, to get over the fact that women are going to be in the workforce. And it seems to me that the um, particularly the, the the Bush administration, the Republicans have been very schizophrenic on on the question of whether they really want women to go into the workforce, whether they're really going to support them in the workforce, or whether they just, or whether the solution is to get them all to get married, you know, wed fair, and that's going to, and everybody's going to live happily ever after. I mean, obviously that's <coughs> not working, and I just wonder if either of you have any ideas about how to approach that, what, what seems to be a really big problem in, in moving ahead on uh, a serious program to get people uh, to, in work, to work with uh, good supports. I really don't have much to say on that. Um, at, at, at a point in my career, I decided I needed to become a little smarter about either race or gender, and I chose race. Um, and uh, I know a little bit about gender and social policy, um, but not as much as I should. So I, I don't have as much to say there. So, my answer to that question would be, again, I think we do better when we, when we don't try to um, chop up the population that, you know, and, and think about special assistance to either gender or race, um, which isn't to say that there are a lot, there are inequalities that really are based on gender and race. Um, w one thing that I saw recently, there's there's been a series of focus groups looking at how we talk about and how we <coughs> build support for paid time off. And one of the things that seems to resonate very strongly with the people in the focus groups is that our, our economy has changed. Our labor market has changed in the last 30 to 40, 50 years dramatically, and yet our policy has never caught up with it. And I think you can talk about it that way without it necessarily, you know, chopping up and dividing the workforce, um, but it's something that resonates with everyone because, you know, it's not just women who are working, but in the case where there are two parents in the household, then you've got two people working, and you don't have the same kind of supports at home you used to have, and it creates issues for people at home that didn't exist in the 1950s that, that resonate for men and for women. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful, but I think that's my take on how to, how to talk about it. I, can I just follow up? I, mean, I just think that if you keep talking about gender as, as something that, that uh, chops up the workforce, I mean, the point is that policy already, poli the, pol the structure of the, wor of the labor force and the structure of social policy already does discriminate by gender. So if you, and race, but especially by gender. And if you don't address it, you know, if you don't say people in the labor, people can't go into the labor force without child care. I mean, that's just like, you know, nobody says that. Or they say, yes, we have child care, but then they don't do anything about it. Right, I mean, but that, how can that you affects that? men crazy. and women, I guess, is my point. Well, okay, all right. But, it's, I, but I mean, what is the, what is the what is the gender of the poor? It's disproportionately female, right? It is disproportionately right. But I I I personally banned the word poverty from my vocabulary. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that doesn't abandon it from the people who, yeah. who uh, abolish it in the lives of the people who are below the whatever it is. Okay. In the back on the on this side, you can. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be behind you. I'll stand up. Uh, my name is Sarah, and I'm from Inclusion. Um, something that you guys both mentioned in your presentation was the importance of garnering public support for sort of the ideas that you're putting forth. Um, sort of as I see there's a lot of young, hopefully idealistic people in the room, what are some ways that you feel like we could move forward doing that today? Or, you know, as we're working in the workplace and trying to bring some of these new ideas into perhaps some of our more welfare-oriented colleagues? I'll, I'll tell you one of the um, more discouraging lessons um, in my book is that it's easiest to help the poor when they're not the focus of public debate. Um, and on this thing, I think I might probably agree with um, here that, that the EITC and Medicaid were expanded at a number of points when people's attention was directed elsewhere. Um, it was directed at fighting deficits, it was directed at um, uh, tax cuts, um, and a few enterprising folks, um, Henry Waxman, um, uh, other members of Congress, managed to slip in some really good legislation. Uh, but when poverty is the focus, like 1981 or 1996, uh, chances are there are going to be cutbacks. Um, so my suggestion is 
uh, to, uh, to have these ideals and be sneaky. <laughs> See, I, 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 I really, I, that's where I think we might disagree, and it comes across in, your, in the last paragraph of your uh, democracy article. I actually think the public discourse matters, and that, that having the public debate and thinking through how we have the public debate in ways that are long-term. So my example of the, the two pieces of legislation that will result if we establish ending poverty as a goal and something we ask all presidential candidates to endorse. I think if we think through how that debate will unfold, we won't like the outcome. So let's think about a goal where we do like the outcome, but let's have the public debate and let's encourage the young people to, to join us in it. I worked on Capitol Hill. I vote for be sneaky. Yes. <laughs> you, yes. Hi, I'm Jane Charles Fitzgerald from the Legal Action Center. Um, my question really is, uh, at the same time that we're talking about, like obviously we want to help the poor or whatnot, there's also the issue that in reality, we depend on people being poor, like coming from perhaps like a middle class perspective or an upper middle class or upper class perspective in order to sustain the way that we live. And so like how do you confront poverty in a place where on a regular everyday basis, you know, we depend on poor people to do our dirty work and our dirty laundry all the time. And so there is that feeling at the same time that we want to confront these things and we want to not see that poverty, but we rely on it for everything that we're doing, and like we're systematically ingrained in doing that. So, Someone pointed out to me recently that um, the current debate over immigration may be, um, is, is going to ultimately have an impact on the poverty debate as well, for just that reason, I think, because you know, we have, you know, immigrants are here, they're doing work, they're doing work that people would say no one else wants to do, but that we depend on, that we need for our economy. And what impact is it having that we have essentially, you know, people who may be here without uh, authority to be here, without legal status, who are doing that work and, and are getting paid very low wages to do it? What impact does that ultimately have on, on the poverty debate? It's a question. I don't know the answer, but it's something to think about. Yeah, and I think that something like that argument does play out at the state and local level. When I've looked at living wage and minimum wage kinds of debates at state and local level, uh, you get that kind of argument. And it does seem to have a certain currency. Um, it doesn't yet play much at the national level, at least in my experience. Yes. Kevin Cotton, Corporation of Enterprise Development. And there are a couple of policy ideas that are out there on the table, some that have been enacted and some that are still on the table, including a split refund, savers credit, uh, children's savings accounts, auto IRAs, and individual development accounts. What role do you think that those policies can play in uh, helping to bridge that gap between even low income and upper income, even uh, the rich, as well as what role can financial literacy play in addressing uh, some of the issues that upper income families are facing? I'll sort of go back to an earlier question. I always want to look at the details to see just exactly who can benefit from these programs because there are a lot of those, especially those that rely on, on tax incentives for various sorts of uh, <coughs> pension plans and whatever, where they, they don't seem to acknowledge that people are, are differently able to take advantage of those with things like 401 and, and KEO plans and things of that nature and IRAs. Um, they seem to be available to all, but uh, if you look at who's actually using them, it tends to be middle and upper middle class. So I could certainly imagine those policies, um, if they were designed in such a way to provide additional help to people with lower incomes, um, <coughs> being really useful. But if they're simply sort of blind across the board, uh, let's just sort of work through the tax code. Uh, the way the tax code is set up with its progressive structure, uh, it's going to help people who, who are already doing fairly well. So I have a, 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 he's in the details and I'm like way up here in the, in the public discourse on this question, which is uh, how do those proposals play out in the public debate and what um, public perception do they reinforce? So if you're talking about savings as something that poor people don't know how to do and don't do very well, then it becomes, it sort of sounds like personal responsibility and I think it, it reinforces the existing frame that people are poor because they don't do the right thing and they need to be helped or prodded to do the right thing. But if you talk about um, 
for example, the, the new convers relatively new conversation about uh, voluntary retirement accounts, universal retirement accounts, and say, well, that is the solution to a problem that exists in our economy. It's not about individuals. It's about our economic situation that we have way too many people who don't have the opportunity to save for their retirement through their workplace, and that we need to create a state create, you know, the states or the federal government should create an opportunity for people to do that. Then I think you create a whole different public discourse and one that's actually helpful. I'll just say, by the way, neither of those were the official New America Foundation <laughs> answer. As our, our program here on assets as a, as a, as a strategy, along with CFED, has, has done a lot of thinking about, you know, in a sense, the policy details and how to avoid the, the kind of outcomes that, that, that Chris is talking about, some of the particular policy designs. So Reed Kramer and, and Ray Bashar and a number of other people here have, uh, have, have done a lot of work on that. Michael. Uh, Michael Calabrese, I co-direct the Next Social Contract uh, here at New America. And yeah, and fo following up right in that is, you know, of course, a lot of what I appreciate about what Chris had to say is a, kind of a cause celeb here at New America for our entire history has been the, the upside down uh, tax system, where when you look at, you know, basic things like health care, housing, retirement saving, that using tax deductions, I mean, Really, I mean, I would hope anyone here would string up, particularly any progressive, so-called progressive politician who would ever use a tax deduction for anything in the future. Because uh, as Chris said, you know, it's, it's, that's basically a 35 cent on the dollar refundable tax credit to people in the high brackets. But if you're, in, if you're basically in the bottom 40%, it's worth zero as far as an incentive or at most 10 cents on the dollar. So, but, so kind of like thinking of that, I, I, you know, the other, the other tax issue um, that's, that could be related to that uh, possibly is the payroll tax, which is, of course, the most regressive uh, tax. It's a flat tax right out of a, you know, a kind of a right-wing dream almost. And um, so I'm wondering if, you know, if, I guess Chris in particular, but both of you, um, you know, how much you know, what are you thinking about using the, the payroll tax as a way to, um, to alleviate, um, you know, to help low-income folks? For example, I mean, a couple examples I'd mention quickly offhand. One is the first X amount of wages could be exempt from the payroll tax. Uh, another possibility is my colleague uh, Michael Lind is just, uh, just about to publish uh, an article, uh, and, and, he's, and he's been talking about this for a while, about possibly allowing, you know, those lower those lower income taxpayers who essentially are excluded from tax deductions for housing, health care, and, and retirement saving to take, uh, to reduce their payroll tax burden, you know, as an alternative. So I don't know, how would you, you know, if you're thinking, about, I'm just wondering what, what you both are thinking about uh, revisiting the payroll tax as a way to, uh, you know, to, 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 to work on uh, income distribution and equalizing some of these incentives for basics. The way I normally think about the, the payroll tax and, and talk about it when I uh, teach is uh, to talk about the cap on income subject to <coughs> payroll taxation and the fact that if you raise that cap, not necessarily uh, eliminate it, but raise it, you can do a lot um, to close the gap in Social Security's financing over the next 75 years. In terms of relief for the payroll tax, that was actually one of the original justifications for the EITC. Um, the EITC was passed right after a series of major increases in Social Security in the late 60s and early 70s. Payroll taxes were becoming um, as important as income taxes for a lot of low-income folks. So the EITC was justified in, in that case. Um, so I, I guess um, I, I tend to still think of the EITC in part as, as mitigating some of that. Um, and the Social Security benefit formula, uh, which is pretty progressive, mitigating some of that as well. Um, but I, I'd certainly uh, entertain ideas about relieving the first, you know, five, ten thousand dollars, whatever, of, of uh, pay payroll from taxation there, um, if coupled with then increasing the cap so that the, the trust fund still has a fair amount of revenue coming to it. Um, if your goal was to get me to start thinking about that, your question. Um, 
we are doing a major initiative on um, low wage work, and one of the things we've done is to review sort of what is low wage work in this country. And one thing we found, as we define low wage work, which is uh, it's a social inclusion measure, so it's a percentage of male male median income, um, and that's eleven dollars and eleven cents an hour. So anybody who earns, earns less than that under our definition is low wage, and that's one in three jobs in the country today, which is a lot of jobs, so many jobs that our focus is on trying to think about. <coughs> while there's uh, lots of good work going on on education and training and 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 work supports and benefits um, on the public side, we ought to be focusing on how do you make those jobs into better jobs and. Maybe this is another thing we should put on our list. Just, Michael, you began your question by saying people should string up any Democratic politician who proposes tax credits or tax deductions. Anyone is unpartisan. You, well, yeah, well, no, you're, the, the answer is you're going to have to go string them all up yeah. or, or become a Republican or maybe look at Mike Gravel because they all have, I mean, it's there. All, you know, there's not, you look at any of the Democratic presidential candidates' websites and it's one tax credit after another, including some of the, you know, the worst, po the, the, probably the worst imaginable proposal for spending a lot of money would be make college tuition tax deductible, you know, which would have no benefit, would not enable one person who's not currently able to go to college to go to college. Um, and, uh, and that's probably the single most popular uh, idea among Democrats. So I think you're partisan only in the sense that you might want to think about the Republican Party because they, <laughs> they don't care about it at all, so they don't do tax credits. Um, anyway, yes. Um, I'm Warren Miller from the House Budget Committee. I have to say this is my own question. It reflects no the opinions of no members of Congress. Um, I was interested in, in, um, in Chris's pro-universalism concept because um, cause it's sort of an interesting frame for the difference between, because I think it's right that a lot of our tax policies are sort of fully universal, but um, it's also sort of an interesting frame if you go back and look at the New Deal, because to a certain extent, Social Security is fully universal in the other way. Although it is universal, it's extremely progressive. And so, you know, we used to have a lot of policies where we said that we were giving the same thing to everyone, but in fact, we gave more to the poor. And now we have these policies where we give, we say we're giving the same thing to everyone, and we give a lot more to the rich. And so, I guess my question is, does, you know, would, you know, would, would Chris say that that is a consequence of a sneakiness, you know, sort of, that the, the people who were, were crafting the policies, you know, snuck in progressive, you know, or, or sort of, you know, focus on the poor, and now the people who are creating the policies are making this tactical decision to use the tax code, and would Margie say that that's a consequence of the debate, you know, of the way the debate was framed, or do you think about it differently? Well, I think one of the differences is that when Social Security was created, it only covered about half of the workforce. Um, and what was interesting is that it covered sort of the middle half. Um, so domestics and agricultural workers were excluded, but so were a lot of professionals, like architects and doctors and engineers. And from that sort of midpoint, they were able to expand over time, high and low, to include the whole population. With a lot of the policies I'm talking about, we started high. And we're discovering that policies that start high don't fall down and, and include everyone low. They stay high. Um, so one of the sort of implications for me is that if you're if you're going to build and you can't, you have to get half a loaf. Make sure you get the right half because if the half is in the top part of the distribution, it's not going to trickle down as as likely. The second part of your question, I think part of the story with Social Security is that it benefited for a couple of decades from a nice benevolent iron triangle of uh, dedicated bureaucrats in the Social Security Administration, a few folks in the House Ways and Means Committee, um, and they managed over time to make the program more generous and, and more um, <laughs> in, inclusive uh, and more progressive, um, but that we don't have that, uh, that situation anymore. Things are much more fluid, uh, and so it's, it's more difficult for me to see Social Security as a good model, um, because I think that's, that was a, a different era. Um, this to me was one of the most interesting things in, in I can't, is this in your book or the article or both? Uh, anyway, d you know, thinking the about infomercial. <laughs> thinking about how how things have changed because I have I've thought about the fact that Social Security and minimum wage those things got ex they they were expanded they were broadened to, to reach more people and whether that's a, a way that we should be thinking about 
moving policy now or not. And, and I think the point that he makes that the world has changed and we might not be able to accomplish these things in the same way because policy is, is it, the way it gets made is different and the public attention or the way your opponents can bring public attention to what you're doing is different. Um, and so does that change the way we should be thinking about it? I don't claim to have the answer, but I think it's a really important question. One of the things that happened in those earlier eras is inflation made a lot of things, a lot of sneaky things possible. You know, it led to it led to steadily increasing revenues, actually at faster than the rate of inflation, which allowed you know all these things, which allowed people like Wilbur Mills to to do some tricks that really did expand those those benefits. Um, yes, I'm Paul Vanderwood with the National Academy of Social Insurance. I was wondering if you could both comment on how your respective analyses or perspectives relate to the. Uh, issue of expanding health insurance coverage. There, the biggest gap is in the middle. For better or worse, most poor people have access to Medicaid or, or something else, and obviously, a upper income people are <coughs> full insured. So, how does your analysis relate to that uh, big issue? Uh, health insurance is still strongly related to income. The, the people who, the odds of being uninsured are still greater for the poor than they are for uh, lower middle or middle income. Um, there are a lot of folks who are not getting Medicaid um, who are poor. Um, that said, um, I mean, th th there is a strategy out there uh, to sort of expand Medicare. Um, and to sort of work your way down, um, cover people 55 to 65, covers them younger, sort of build that way. Um, that here's a, a politically powerful program and you ought to build off that. Um, I think that is uh, a possibility. I think um, building off Medicaid has also shown to, to have its possibilities as well. Uh, I don't think there's a, a unique solution um, to that problem. So I, th I think about it in terms of how do we talk about it in order to in, in to move the debate and uh, what are some of the things that are happening out there that are useful in thinking about how to talk about it in our um, review of what's happening across the country to make jobs, low wage jobs into better jobs, one thing that we've noticed is some of the approaches taken in places like San Francisco or, or Massachusetts where they've gone to really delinking healthcare from the workplace um, and talking about it that way. Again, it's this question of the economy is is broken and we in order for it to benefit all of us we need to find ways to fix the health care the way we deliver our health our health care coverage and maybe that means delinking it from the workplace um, there are people who are studying very carefully how to how to talk about it and um, they will tell you that when you start talking about universal coverage uh, you run into a problem because people who have coverage think that means they will have to give up something in order for everyone else to have coverage. And so um, being careful about the way that we talk about it is not in, in that area is another place where it's important. Jim Wong. Jim Wong, Food Research National Center. I want to say something else. First on Medicaid. It's only can, you, can you speak up, Jim? Yeah. Sure. It's only kids who are covered uh, above the poverty line of Medicaid for their parents. Most states, the eligibility levels are still at 50 to 60 percent of poverty, or worse, and for non parents, there's no coverage at all. But that's not what I wanted to say. Um, I wanted to expand on Margie's point about how the world has changed, because I think the entire conversation hasn't taken into account how much the world has changed. And it's impossible to overstate how those changes the last 30 years have changed all these issues, whether it's women going to the workforce, the aging of the population that's driving health and social security costs, the change in the health system, globalization, uh, the weakening of unions. The world, uh, the context is in many ways 180 degrees different from when we started on these issues, many of us three years ago or whatever before. And, and so I think some of the debate between universalism and targeting and poverty and not poverty is, is an ingrown debate that doesn't look out at how the world's changed and figure out how we're dealing with the world as it has changed and moving forward this issue. Question one. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess I'll put, the, I'll put the question on it, which is if, if the world can change once, why can't it change again? <laughs> what, would you, what would you want to do to change the underlying climate that, that make things possible in a different way? <laughs> no, I don't expect them to have answers either. Nobody, nobody I know does. 
Yeah, I mean, I think um, here I'll probably borrow from Jacob Hacker's work on risk and say that I think part of the story is trying to persuade people that the risk of bad things happening to them is, is in some ways harder to control and, and greater than it used to be. And, and because of that, um, you know, your chances of needing unemployment insurance, your chances of, of needing some disability benefits, um, your chances of needing uh, help with uh, education and childcare are, are greater than they used to be. Um, and that simply because you've been born into a good family and played by the rules and gone to good schools isn't necessarily a guarantee that you can do it all by yourself. Uh, you know, I guess I, I think that the way we have to think about this is what's the way to talk about it in ways that generate the most public support and figuring out what those conversation starting places are is the thing that I'm really most focused on. So I don't, I'm not sure if that, that's one possibility. There are others. Um, making sure that we don't necessarily try to persuade people or throw data at them to explain how the world has changed. When I, what I find going out outside of Washington and talking about these issues is that people, um, people are already there trying to think about how to have the conversation differently, and they're struggling with that question, and they're coming up with some answers of their own. And it's a very different debate than the one we have here in Washington. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Jed Schilling with the Millennium Institute. Two quick comments <coughs> on the question. The first one on the Bloomberg pay people for doing good. The World Bank is supporting some programs in Latin America and Brazil you may want to look at that seems to be making reasonable progress on that, but it's not a perfect my, solution. Yeah, my objection is not whether it will work or not. It's that he's shining a spotlight okay. on one piece of his larger program, which is all about, you know, it reinforces the dominant belief that people are poor because they've done something wrong. Okay. okay. Uh, the, uh, the other thing on Social Security, one thing that doesn't get nearly enough attention is the extent to which Social Security surpluses have supported the tax efforts to keep taxes down because Social Security generates almost $200 billion a year of surplus and that is counted by reducing the announced budget. So the budget deficit is smaller because of that surplus which is really going into the trust fund and most people don't know that. So they think Social Security is much more of a threat than it is and that needs to get out more. My question is going back to your comment about looking at raci racism rather than gender more, is to what extent the residual racism among the conservatives affects the way many of these poverty programs are distorted. We see them suddenly opposed to people who are working hard in the immigration reform programs because I think there's a racist undertone to that and they're not proposing anything other than continuing the present system uh, in effect. So what role do you see this res the residual racism on the conservative side playing in distorting the way poverty programs are administered and structured? I can't speak as much to sort of the rhetoric and ideology, but I can say that um, there's sort of one school of thought out there that says that, that since we've been um, years since the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, racism has pretty much disappeared from as a political force and others who say, well, it's disappeared most places but not welfare. Um, I did a little number crunching in this book at, at sort of comparing benefits for various programs like Medicaid and workers' comp and unemployment insurance um, around the states and it's still related in a negative way to race. Um, so I think that there's still something out there uh, in terms of the way the benefits are delivered, um, which for me at the sort of the end of the day is, is as important as anything else. I mean, we care about the discourse in part because we care about who's getting how much money. Um, and if you look at states with large populations of African Americans and Hispanics, they tend to be less generous still. There's some very interesting recent uh, work in this area uh, that Frameworks Institute has done looking at the um, you know, how to talk about or not talk about race in order to achieve policy results that address racial inequities. So I just would encourage you all to look at it if you're interested in this question. Yeah, John Powell at the University of Minnesota has also had some has interesting ideas about that. Other questions? I know there are people I didn't get to before. In the back, yes. Uh, <clears throat> David State Policy America, uh, the Government Accountability Office released a report not so long ago current fiscal trends aren't sustainable. Uh, 
essentially calculating, comprising uh, support with the Cockworth Coalition that's been doing for decades now. Uh, it can include interest on the debt, uh, social entitlement uh, spending that's somewhere around 2035, 2037, all the federal budget that was lost. And the question I have is to what extent that puts uh, an untenable compression effect on discretionary spending, whether or not we're going to see a wholesale cashiering of social entitlements for poor people in discretionary programs, essentially uh, terminating the more progressive aspects of the welfare states. Well, I'll, I'll make a, a partial stab at this. Um, I'm less concerned in, in terms of projection of the entitlements. I'm less concerned about Social Security than I am about health care. Um, I think Social Security is, is a longer run problem and we've got pretty good experience um, with <laughs> fixing Social Security. Um, we've got a number of options for um, restoring the trust fund to good health. Um, health care, we're pretty clueless. Um, and, and those are the programs that are really going rapidly. And so um, I, I would rather, I, I think it's not so much an entitlement problem, it's a health care problem. Uh, and that's the way I guess I would start uh, to, to think about it. I think we have an, a, a kind of a window of opportunity right now, which is there's a fair amount of media focus on inequality and on, on low wage work. and. And even recently on this question of how do we deal with poverty because there's some political, a political aspect to it. And so, you know, given that we're trying to think long term about where we're trying to go and what might happen, we, we have to make sure we get it right in this open window um, and, and it would be very easy to get it wrong. So thinking carefully about, you know, how we take advantage of it is something that we have to do uh, in order to address these longer term issues. If I could take a quick, make a quick comment on that question. I mean, Henry Aaron at the Brookings Institution has a wonderful PowerPoint presentation. Basically, it says the deficit problem is a health care, is a health financing problem, and it 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 it's a pretty airtight uh, case. My view of that longer term problem is that is that the those that fiscal circumstance will force a health care discussion and will also force a reopening of the discussion about revenues, which has basically been a question of, of you know, essentially predetermining your level of revenues before you do anything else. Once you blow that practice of sort of tax cuts over all, all other choices, uh, once you blow that open, you have some opportunity to, to sort of rethink all of the pieces. And if you do health, if you could do health care right, you could do it in a way that's, uh, that, 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 that's, that's that's better for the uh, for the federal budget as long as you also have revenues open to to debate and you can imagine a world where we really uh, we're really not constrained in the way that we assume we are now by how we think about taxes and, 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 and so forth so that's where I think that's maybe there's potentially there's a little opportunity in that pressure yes uh, a question Jeremy Smith with the CIU Marty sorry to put you on the spot here but um, this idea of we have this moment, there's this window, and we have to get it right. What would some of the elements of getting it right look like? Well, okay, so I have, I'm really personally a big fan of the social inclusion concept, of, make, of the idea that we try to make sure that we all, it's, it's important to all of us that everyone do relatively well, that we don't let anyone fall too far behind, that it weakens all of us and our democracy and civic participation if too many people fall too far behind. And we're heading in that direction. So that if we change the goal and make it, you know, our goal be that we all progress together, we, that we do well together, that, that strengthens all of us. How we talk about <coughs> it and how that translates into a policy conversation, I don't know the answer. And I would actually like to see, you know, some funders invest in helping us develop that answer. I think that's an important thing that we could do to help get it right. Always about the fun. <laughs> uh, anybody else? We can, uh, I think, are we about at the, we're about at the end here. Thank you all for coming. Again, I was really, really pleased to see such a good turnout. Thank you.